Good day, everyone. Welcome back to Introduction to Financial Accounting 2. Uh, today, we're looking at Chapter 15, uh, which talks about long-term liabilities. This chapter has four learning objectives, but we are only covering the first two. The first one is describe the major characteristics of bonds, and two, explain how to account for bond transactions. So let's begin our lecture. So let's get started with the first learning objective for today. Describe the major characteristics of bonds. But before we do that, uh, let's take a quick uh, look at long-term liabilities to sort of view what that means. These are basically obligations that are expected to be paid uh, after one year. Okay, so the uh, maturity or the, um, the due date is uh, longer than one year and with that uh, distinction or that cutoff point we can distinguish between short-term liabilities that we covered before and long-term liabilities now long-term liabilities include bonds and bonds are simply a form of interest-bearing notes payable uh, these are loans that are given to uh, borrowers by the lenders so the person who issues the bond and sells it uh, is the borrower uh, usually is a company or a government and the person who buys the bond and holds it uh, and withholding that bond he gets uh, certain interest payments uh, regularly and then gets his money back at the end is considered the lender or the person who is lending uh, the money to someone else or the investor these are sold in small denominations usually 1000 or multiples of thousands usually 10,000 or so uh, and of course they attract many investors because they are uh, cash generating investments uh, meaning that you can invest or buy these bonds and expect to be paid a certain amount of cash on a regular basis it's worth noting that bonds can take multiple forms so there are different types of bonds we have secured bonds where they have collateral to back them up. So in case there is a default or an inability to pay the bond and the interest on that bond, the investors are guaranteed to get their investment back. And that guarantee would be in the form of collateral, meaning some sort of asset to back those bonds. So that asset can be sold and those investors can be paid back. Uh, on the other hand, we have unsecured bonds. These don't have any assets to back them up or no assets as collateral. Uh, we have what is called convertible bond, where the bond can be converted into stock or stock options. And we have callable bonds, uh, where these bonds give the right to the issuer to call them back at any stage uh, to resolve them or to uh, settle them, pay them in full and uh, terminate those bonds. Let's take a look at how bonds are issued or the issuing procedures for bonds. Um, this procedure begins with the state laws that grant corporations the power to issue bonds. Uh, the board of directors then needs uh, to approve the bond issue, of course, including the stockholders. If there's any stockholders, of course, these guys have voting rights and they can vote in such a uh, matter uh, and then the board of directors must uh, stipulate number of bonds to be authorized uh, they need to also decide the face value and the contractual interest rate that they are going to pay uh, on top of these uh, bonds uh, and then they need to set the bond terms uh, in a legal document known as a bond indenture and the bond certificate uh, they would issue the bond certificate, which typically uh, is a at $1,000 face value. Uh, those certificates would represent a promise to pay two things, a sum of money at a designated maturity date, which is typically the actual borrowed amount, plus a periodic interest at a contractual or a stated rate on the maturity amount face value. Uh, now, the interest could be paid either semi-annually, annually, or quarterly, or even monthly, but typically is paid semi-annually, meaning 
two times a year, so every six months. Um, these are issued to obtain large amounts of long-term capital. So corporations or corporations usually issue bonds in order to get some funding or financing so for their projects uh, and pay that funding over a certain period of time without having to give out any uh, part of the ownership of the company. Um, the investment company then sells those bonds for the issuing uh, company uh, so offer them on the markets through investment banks to investors who are willing and interested to buy those bonds now the bonds are usually bought by a certain group of people who are either wealthy individuals or people who are closer to the retirement age uh, with the purpose of capital preservation and generating cash flow uh, this kind of investment that doesn't really offer uh, much growth in value uh, is suitable for that kind of um, investment goal which is to preserve your wealth and to generate some cash flow we now live in the digital age and everything is online but uh, back in the days this is a sample of what a bond certificate might look like and as you can see it has the issuer of bonds name on it it has the maturity date and it has the face value or par value per bond or per certificate and it has the contractual interest rates on it as well how can we determine the market value of a bond now the market value of a bond uh, just as uh, just as the case in uh, pretty much any investment you need to calculate the present value of what you expect that investment to be in the future so with bonds you can figure out the current market price of a bond or what we call the present value uh, based on three factors the dollar amounts to be received the length of time until the amounts are received and the market rate of interest now the market rate of interest is the rate investors demand for loaning funds and of course that is affected by multiple factors including the interbank interest rates the level of risk and so on let's look at this illustration together to try and understand how we can figure out the market value of a certain bond the illustration says assume that acropolis company on january 1st 2017 issues 100,000 of nine percent bonds due in five years with interest payable annually at uh, at the end of year uh, the purchaser of the uh, bonds would receive the following two types of cash payments one the principal of 100,000 to be paid at maturity meaning at the end of the fifth year and two five nine thousand dollar interest payments so 100,000 multiplied by nine percent that gives us the nine thousand and those are paid five times so once every year at the end of each year okay over the term of the uh, bond now how can we evaluate the market value of this bond? let's see how we can do this in the following slide now simply put the current market price of a bond is equal to the present value of all the future cash payments promised by the bond and as we mentioned we have two types of payments here we have one-off payments of one hundred thousand dollars at the end of the fifth year so we need to discount that uh, with a simple present value uh, formula over the uh, five years and that will give us sixty four thousand nine hundred and ninety three dollars and then we have a, a present value of annuity uh, the uh, annuity payment in this case is the nine thousand and we need to discount this over five years uh, that will give us thirty five thousand and seven dollars we add those two together that gives us a market price of the bond of one hundred thousand dollars Let's go over this uh, true or false exercise together. State whether each of the following statements is true or false. Number one, mortgage bonds and sinking fund bonds are both examples of secured bonds. Uh, this is true. Number two, unsecured bonds are also known as debenture bonds. This is also true. Number three, the stated rate is the rate investors demand for loaning funds. Of course, this one is false. 
Number four, the face value is the amount of principal the issuing company must pay at the maturity date. That is correct. And finally, number five, the market price of a bond is equal to its maturity value. And from the exercise that we just finished, we established that this is not correct. So this one is false. Moving on to the second learning objective for today, uh, explain how to account for bond transactions. Now, a corporation that issues bonds would need to record bond transactions in three cases. Uh, when they issue a bond, so basically when they sell a bond, uh, when they redeem the bond or buy it back, and when bondholders convert the bonds into common stock, in the case of convertible stocks that we mentioned earlier. Uh, now, notice that if the bondholders sell their bond investments to other investors in a stock exchange or something like that, or in an exchange or in the market, the issuing company receives no further money on the transaction. And based on that, that is not an event or an economic event that directly affects the company's financial position. So based on that, if you remember from your study in Accounting 1, that means we do not record any transaction in that case. We're going to learn how to record uh, transactions for uh, bonds, starting with issuing bonds. How do we record uh, bond issuance or selling bonds, right? Uh, and those kind of transactions might fall under three categories. The company could issue the bond at face value, okay? Uh, we would record it in a uh, certain way. I'll show you that shortly. Uh, they could sell the bond for a discount. Okay, or they could sell the bond for a premium, right? Uh, you have here the illustration that shows you interest rates and bond prices. Um, and it, it's, it helps to see that and to try to understand uh, the relationship between the market interest rate and the interest rate on the bond and how that affects the sale price for the bond. Okay, so when the bond is issued or the bond holds a contractual interest rate that is 10%, for example, we have multiple scenarios here where the market interest rate is lower than 10% or equal to 10% or higher than the contractual interest rate. And in this case, you have the example here of 12%. Now think about this logically. If you have a bond that offers an interest rate that is higher than the market interest rate, are you gonna sell it cheaper than its actual price? Or are you gonna sell it as its actual price? Or are you going to sell it for a higher price than its actual price? Of course, if your bond offers, a, uh, offers an interest rate that is higher than the market interest rate, then you uh, automatically going to require a premium to sell it. So you're probably going to sell it for more than its face value, right? If the bond's contractual interest rate is identical to the market interest rate, then in that case, you're going to sell it for its face value. So no premium, no discount. And the third scenario where you have a contractual interest rate or bond interest that is lower than the market interest rate, in that case, of course, you're going to have to decrease your required price. So you're basically going to sell the bond for a discount in order to be able to sell it, right? So it does make sense. Just think about it for a little bit. Okay, we have a quick question. The rate of interest investors demand for loaning funds to a corporation is the contractual interest rate, the face value rate, or the market interest rate, or the stated interest rate. Of course, based on what we've seen in the illustration before, the answer here is C, market interest rate. Another question, Carson Inc. issues 10-year bonds with a maturity value of 200,000. If the bonds are issued at a premium, this indicates that A, the contractual interest rate exceeds the market interest rate, B, the market interest rate exceeds the contractual interest rate, C, the contractual interest rate and the market interest rate are the same, or D, no relationship exists between the two rates. Of course, the answer here, since the, um, the bond is selling at a premium, that means the contractual interest rate is higher than the market interest rate. So based on that, the correct answer here is A.
Now we mentioned earlier that selling bonds might be at face value or on a premium or in a discount. So it does make sense that recording the transaction for selling bonds would be different for each case, right? So we're gonna see how each case is recorded in the uh, following example. Starting with this one, uh, this one is for issuing bonds at face value. Uh, the illustration says on January 1st, 2017, Candlestick Incorporation issues $100,000 five-year 10% bond at 100% or uh, 100 of the face value. The entry to record the sale would be, of course, cash. So we're going to debit cash of the amount that we receive, which is $100,000, and credit bonds payable. Okay, so we're going to credit the long-term liability account of bonds payable. Simple as that. Now, what do we need to record when we pay interest on that bond? So going back to the same illustration that we covered earlier, uh, it goes on to say, assume that interest is payable annually on January 1st uh, at December 31st, 2017. Candlestick recognizes interest expense incurred with the following entry. Assume monthly accruals have not been made. So that means you are adjusting for the whole year at the end of the year. Okay. In that case, we're going to enter this transaction. We're going to debit interest expense, uh, 10,000, which is 10% on the 100,000. And we're going to credit interest payable for the same amount. The adjusting entry we recorded in the previous slide now needs to be closed when the company actually pays out the amount, right? So assume that interest is payable annually on January 1st. Candlestick records the payments on January 1st, 2018. So now they are actually going to give away or to pay out the money to the bondholders. In that case, we're going to close the interest payable account uh, and we're going to credit cash. So the liability account, which is interest payable, is going to be reduced. So we're going to debit it by 10,000. And our cash, which is an asset, is also going to be reduced. So we're going to credit it since it's an asset for the same amount, which is $10,000. Now, what if the company offers a, a contractual interest rate that is lower than the market interest rate? And based on that, they need to sell the, uh, the bond that they issue on a discount. Uh, what are we going to do in that case? So let's look at this illustration and see how we can handle this. On January 1st, 2017, Candlestick Incorporation sells 100,000 five-year 10% bonds for 98,000. So that's 98% of face value. Uh, interest is payable annually on January 1st. The entry to record the issuance is as follows. Uh, and of course, when, once we sell those bonds, we're gonna get some cash, right? The cash we're going to receive is only 98,000, which is less than the face value of the bond. So we're going to debit cash 98,000 and we're going to credit bonds payable 100,000. So what do we do with the difference here? Uh, of course, we know that we, in the double entry system, we need to have balanced entries. So each entry needs to have a debit and a credit side that equal each other. We're gonna close this gap using an account called discount on bonds payable. This is a new account for you. This is a long-term liability contra account so it's a long-term liability account but it has the opposite debit and credit rules to the other liability accounts so this specific account increase by debit and decrease by credit right so we're going to debit this account uh, discount on bonds payable and based on that that means we are increasing the balance of this account all right so the final entry is going to be like this Cash debit 98,000, discount on bonds payable debit 2,000, and credit to bonds payable 100,000. Now let's see how the new account that we just learned is going to be uh, represented in the financial statements. As I mentioned in the previous slide, this is a long term liability contract account. So based on that, it's going to show up on the balance sheet in the long term liabilities uh, section but it's going to be a, um, a deduction or a contra or an, a, 
an opposing balance to the bonds to the bonds payable account. So as you can see, we have bonds payable with the actual face value of 100,000. And then we are deducting discount on bonds payable, the 2,000 that we have just uh, recorded in the previous slide. Okay. Now the sale of bonds below face value or on a discount equals total cost of borrowing greater than the interest paid. Uh, and the reason being that the borrower is required to pay the bond discount at the maturity date. Therefore, the bond discount is considered to be an increase in the cost of borrowing. All right. And this slide shows you how the bond discount can increase the cost of borrowing. This is uh, an illustration 15-6 in front of you. Uh, shows you the total cost of borrowing. Right, so for the bonds that we have issued at a discount, we're going to have annual interest payments of 10% on the face value, which is 10,000 multiplied by five years, since we are giving that out that interest once every year for five years. So that's $50,000. We also need to add the bond discount, which is the difference between the face value and the amount of cash that we actually um, collected for the sale of the bonds, which is 98,000. So the difference that we recorded in our journal entry before, in this case 2000, is going to be added to the uh, total cost of borrowing. So that will give us a total cost of borrowing of 52,000. Okay. Another way to calculate the total cost of borrowing is by uh, applying the method shown on illustration 15-7. Uh, in this uh, illustration you can see that we are using the total amounts right so we start with the principal at maturity which is a hundred thousand which is the face value of the bond plus the annual interest payments as we mentioned ten thousand multiplied by five which is ten thousand dollars paid every year for five years that's fifty thousand these two together would give us the cash to be paid to the bond holders so the total amount that we are going to give out to the bondholders as a company is going to be 150,000. Now we subtract from that the cash that we will receive from the bondholders, which is the $98,000 that we received initially for for uh, in exchange for the bonds, right? So we subtract 98,000 from 150 and we're going to get the total cost of borrowing of the difference which is 52,000. Just a quick note before we move on, and you need to know that the bond discount uh, needs to be amortized over the um, the holding period of the bond, right? So just like depreciation, when we um, distribute the, depreci the depreciation over the useful life of the assets, we do this as well with the bond discount, which is the 2000 that we calculated before. This amount uh, needs to be amortized over the five year period of the, um, uh, the until the maturity life of the bond that we have issued. Quick review question. Discount on bonds payable has a credit balance. B is a contra account. C is added to bonds payable on the balance sheet. D increase over or increases over the term of the bond. Now the only correct answer out of these is B. Discount on bonds payable is a contra account. Now the third scenario is issuing bonds at a premium. So what happens then? Uh, let's look at this illustration. On January 1st, 2017, Candlestick and Corporation sells $100,000 five-year, 10% bonds for $102,000. That means 102% of face value. Now the interest is payable annually on January. And the entry to record the issuance is going to be like this. We're going to debit cash on January 1st for the total amount collected from the borrowers or from the investors, which is 102,000. Now to balance this transaction, we're going to have the bonds payable account on the credit side, which represents the total face value of the bonds, which is 100,000. But now we have a gap of 2000 between the cash we received and the face value or the bonds payable account or the amount we credit to the bonds payable. And that gap of 2000 is going to go to another new account that you're learning for the first time, which is 
premium on bonds payable. Premium on bonds payable. Now this is a long-term liability account, and as you can see in the top right corner, you have uh, what the T balance of this account would look like. It takes the same debit and credit rules as the normal liability accounts, so it increases with credit and decreases with debits, and it has a normal balance of credit. Again, when it comes to statement representation, this is going to show up on the balance sheet in the long-term liability section right under bonds payable. So in that case, we're going to have bonds payable of 100,000, but this time we're going to add premium on bonds payable of 2,000. So we're going to have a total of $102,000. Now the sale of bonds above face value or on a premium means that the total cost of borrowing is less than the interest paid. And the reason is that the borrower is not required to pay the bond premium at the maturity date of the bonds. Therefore, the bond premium is considered to be a reduction in the cost of borrowing. Let's see how is that calculated in the following slide. Now to figure out the total cost of borrowing for this case, selling on a premium, we're going to calculate the annual interest payments just like we've done before. So $100,000 multiplied by 10%, that gives us 10000 we multiply that by the number of years, which is five, that gives us $50,000. Less bond premium. So now we're going to subtract any bond premium that we collected, which is the 2,000 in this case. So the 2,000 is going to be actually deducted from the 50,000 and that will give us a total cost of borrowing under this assumption of $48,000. Alternatively, you can calculate it by the totals, just like we've done in the, um, um, setting the bond on a discount example. We're gonna figure out the principal at maturity, which is 100,000 or the face value. And we're going to add annual interest payments again for 50,000. That will give us 150,000 of cash to be paid to the bondholders. Now in return, how much we're going to actually receive from the bondholders, we received 102,000. So we're gonna subtract this 102,000 from 150,000 and that will give us the total cost of borrowing of $48,000. Here we have an extra exercise, a do-it-yourself example. So as always, feel free to pause the video and give it a go. Now what happens when the company redeems the bonds? Uh, it has multiple scenarios as well. Here we're going to start with a scenario that the company redeems its bonds at maturity date. So assuming that the company pays and records separately the interest for the last interest period, Candlestick records the redemption of its bond at maturity as follows. Simply, we're going to put thing in, things in reverse. If you remember the first transaction that we recorded, the sale of bond at face value, this is going to be the opposite. So we're going to debit bonds payable with the amount of face value, which is 100,000. And we're going to credit cash account, uh, since we're paying out money, the same amount, which is $100,000. I remember how we said there is a type of bonds called callable bonds that the company might decide to terminate earlier than the maturity date. Uh, the company can do something like that, especially if it's a callable bond, but they need to take a few uh, considerations. Uh, the first one is to eliminate carrying value of bonds at redemption date. Number two, to record the cash paid. And number three, to recognize any gain or loss on the redemption process. So the carrying value of the bonds is the face value of the bonds less any remaining bond discount or plus any remaining bond premium at the redemption date. Here's a question that says, when bonds are redeemed before maturity, the gain or loss on redemption is the difference between the cash paid and the, as we uh, have learned in the previous slide, of course, the answer here is carrying value of the bonds, which is A. Now let's see how redeeming bonds before maturity is recorded on the general journal. And the illustration says, assume Candlestick Incorporation has sold its bonds at a premium. 
at the end of the fourth period, Candlestick retires these bonds at 103 after paying the annual interest. The carrying value of the bonds at the redemption date is $100,000 and $400. Candlestick makes the following entry to record the redemption at the end of the fourth interest period, which is January 1st, 2021. And of course, on that day, we're going to debit bonds payable for the $100,000. Uh, we're going to debit premium on bonds payable for the $400 that we got as a premium. And we're going to debit loss on bond redemption, which is 2600 in this case. All of these are going to be uh, balanced by a credit to the cash account of $103,000. What about converting bonds into common stock? Now, until conversion... The bondholder receives interest on the bond regularly. For the issuer, the bonds sell at a higher price and pay a lower rate of interest than comparable debt securities without the conversion option. Now, upon conversion, the company transfers the carrying value of the bonds to paid-in capital accounts. No gain or loss is recognized in that case. Let's look at an example in the following slide. The example says on July 1st, Saunders Associates converts 100,000 bonds sold at base value into 2,000 shares of $10 par value common stock. Both the bonds and the common stock have a market value of $130,000. Saunders, maker, um, Saunders makes the following entry to record the conversion. Now the entry is going to look like this. We're going to debit bonds payable for 100,000 and credit common stock uh, for uh, the 2,000 shares multiplied by $10, that will give us 20,000. And the difference in this case between the um, face value of the bond, which is 100,000, and the value of the common stock is gonna go into paid in capital in excess of par for common stock. So we're gonna credit that account for $80,000. Quick review a question. When bonds are converted into common stock, A, a gain or loss is recognized. B, the carrying value of the bonds is transferred to paid in capital accounts. C, the market price of the stock is considered in the entry. Or D, the market price of the bonds is transferred to paid in capital. And of course, the answer here is B, the carrying value of the bond, just like we've done in the previous example, is transferred to paid in capital accounts. Finally, we wrap up the lecture with this do-it-yourself exercise. As always, feel free to pause this one and give it a go on your own. And here we are. We've done chapter 15. We looked at the first and second learning objectives for this chapter. These are the ones that are required from you. Hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Uh, as always, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, right now or down in the comments. I'll be more than happy to try and answer all of your questions. Thank you so much.